All right, so let's go back to Genesis uh, 33. It's not a very long chapter. There's not a lot that uh, develops there, uh, but there's still a lot of great lessons. There's still a lot of great things that we can take from the life of Jacob here. And uh, just as a reminder, when we looked at Genesis 32, uh, we saw that Jacob was preparing himself to meet Esau. You know, he was afraid that Esau would kill him, would slay him. And Jacob, we see him just praying to the Lord, praying for deliverance, praying for safety, to the point that his prayer is, is manifested in a physical form with, with uh, Jacob wrestling, physically wrestling with the Lord Jesus Christ and asking for those supplications, asking for those prayers to be answered. He would not let go of Jesus until he knew those prayers were answered. And I just quickly look at verse number 32 again. Look at verse number 30. Genesis 32, Genesis 32 verse 30. Just as a reminder, so after he wrestles with Jesus Christ, it says here, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just keep that in mind. He says he's seen God face to face. Okay? He's, he's seen the grace of God. He's received the blessings of God. He believes his prayer has been answered. Now, when you go to Genesis 33, look at verse number 11. Genesis 33, verse 11. Uh, it says here, Take I pray thee my blessing that is brought to thee, because God have dealt graciously. I'll just stop there. Because God have dealt gracious, graciously. That's the title for the sermon this morning. God have dealt graciously. You know, Jacob has gone to God in prayer, has seen Jesus Christ face to face, and he sees, well, God has dealt with me graciously. I received the grace of God as it were. So let's pick it up there in verse number 1, Genesis 33, verse 1. Now remember, Esau is coming, he's making his way to Jacob. He's coming with 400 men. And that's what gave Jacob great fear, that these 400 men would be trained soldiers or something that would come and slay him and his, and his family and his servants. And it says here, And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. <clears throat> and he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel, and unto the two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and the children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. Now, I'll stop there for a moment. I've heard people accuse Jacob here. I've heard people accuse him that he's put in, he's still afraid at this point, that he's still afraid that Esau will come and slay him. And so he divides his family up, okay? And he puts the concubines first with their children, and then his, his, his favored wife, Rachel, at the end. That, I, I've heard that preached or taught. That in case, you know, Esau comes to slay his, his, you know, the first concubine, his first wife, as it were, and the children, they would still be able to flee. I, I don't believe that at all. <laughs> I don't believe that at all. We saw in the previous chapter that he's already had the answer to prayer. God has already blessed him. God has already told him that he's got power with God and with men. God has pretty much told him, your prayers have been, ans been answered, Jacob. Okay, so I don't believe this is some sort of defensive process that he's going through, that he's going to meet Esau with. I just believe this is the way he's done it, uh, so he can introduce his family, you know, the wives and the children that belong to these women, and introduce his family to Esau. That's what I see happening. I don't believe this is some sort of fear tactic. I, I don't believe he's, look, if, even if this was a, a ploy to, to if, in case Esau went to slew, slay his, his, his uh, concubine and, and the children, there's no way they're going to get away from that anyway. There's 400 men, okay? This isn't some defensive thing. This is just him presenting now. They, you know, Esau has seen the servants. He's seen the cattle, the gifts that uh, Jacob has given to Esau. Now he's introducing his family to Esau. And then he keeps going here in verse number 3. And he passed before them. He passed before all the concubines, the wives, and the children. <clears throat> and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Look at, look at Esau's reaction. Verse number four, and Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. What a great reunion. What a great reunion. 20 years of conflict, 20 years of separation, 20 years of fears, 20 years of burdens, all right? Unresolved disputes. And they finally meet and they, you know, Esau runs to meet him. You know, Esau doesn't run to slay him. He runs, he embraces him. And the Bible says he embraced him and fell on his neck. I just want you to remember that phrase. Embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. I mean, this was a long-waited reunion. 
And brethren, you know, I've been going through conflict resolution in the last two chapters with you, and you'll probably find, you know, the conflicts, the disputes that you have unresolved with, with good friends, with family, with whoever it is, that if you just sort it out, if you just do what's right, if you just go and resolve the conflict, you're going to have a situation just like this, where, where you just sort it out, you know, you, you come closer than you were before, and you can just put that behind you. I mean, looking at their reaction, this is something that's been a burden on their hearts. This is something that's been a burden on their minds. And finally, that burden has been lifted, and they can't help themselves but embrace. They can't help but show some physical affection and even weep. You know, finally it's over. Finally we're reunited after these 20 years. So brethren, please, if you have unresolved conflicts, go sort it out. You know, you're just destroying your life. It's just that thing that's going to be at the back of your mind for the rest of your life. Unresolved dispute. When I mean, you can just resolve it and get, get it over with. This is why these stories are here for us in the Bible. So we can learn. I mean, this guy's about to kill him. Esau made an oath to kill Jacob. I doubt the person that you're, you have unresolved disputes with. I, I doubt that. They, they've made a vow to kill you. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure the, the dispute that you have with others are not as severe as this. So go out there and resolve them. You know, that's what the Lord wants from you. Please keep your finger there and go to Luke, please. The book of Luke, chapter 15. Luke, chapter 15. And I want you to just remember there how Esau reacted. He ran to meet him, embraced him, fell on his neck and kissed him. And as we turn to Luke 15, we have a parable that Jesus Christ taught, which basically takes this almost word for word, and Jesus Christ tells a story. And so I, I believe just by the, by the nature of how similar it is, I believe these two stories need to come hand to hand. So back to Luke 15 verse 20. Luke 15 verse 20, we have the story of the prodigal son, right? Where, 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 where a father had two sons, and one of the sons took an early inheritance, took everything that would come to him from his father, and he went off into a far country. He wasted it all. He lived worldly. You know, he was away from his father, and he ends up broke, right? He ends up broke fee feeding. He was working on a farm feeding uh, pigs, you know, feeding unclean animals, as it were, for this time of, of, of state. And he finally comes to himself. He come, finally comes and realizes, man, I was better off with my father. I'm better off just being a servant to my father than being here feeding these pigs. And so he makes, according to the parable, of course, of Jesus Christ, this prodigal son makes his journey back to his father. And of course, before I, before I read verse 20, the picture there is the father is our Lord God Father. You know, the God the Father. And the picture of the prodigal son is not salvation. It's not someone that was lost and, and on their way to hell and they've been reunited back to the father. No, this is someone that was a, already a child of God. Someone that is already saved, a child of the family. Okay? But then he leaves the father, he goes, lives, lives a worldly life. This is the picture of a backslidden Christian, far from God, you know, just living like the world, where that backslidden Christian finally realizes, finally wakes up to himself and says, look, I was just better off when I was with God the Father. I was better off when I was in fellowship with God. And so we pick it up there in verse number 20. It says here, and he arose, that's the prodigal son, and he arose and came to his father, look at this, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Pretty much identical, right? From Genesis chapter 33, I believe Jesus Christ is telling us the story to bring back to remembrance the, you know, how Esau and Jacob were reunited. Okay? And then it says here in verse number 21, And the son said unto, his, unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. They began to be merry. Joyful, happy, right? Relieved, it's been sorted. The father has his son once again. And brethren, you know, I don't know your spiritual state. I know you're here in church today, but I don't know, maybe your heart is far from God. You know, you're in church, maybe you're going through the motions. 
When's the last time you've prayed to the Lord? When's the last time you've picked up the Bible? When's the last time you've been in fellowship with God? You know, if you're in a backslidden state, you need to go back to the Father. And you go back to God. You know what? He's not going to, he's not going to throw you in prison or something. Right? He's not going to reprimand you. If you're in a fast state from God, the Lord God is going to run to you. He's going to embrace you. He's going to welcome you back. He's going to kiss you, fall on your neck, as it were. You know, when we're far from God, God wants nothing more than to be reunited with his children. And this is the story we see from Jacob and Esau. You know, and when you're walking in the world, when you're walking against God, when you're committing sin, you are hurting the fellowship that you have with God the Father. You know, you're removing yourself from his presence. You know, and, and when you're far from God, you are going to feel that his presence is far away. Okay? Not because God left you. The story isn't the father left the son. The story is the son left the father. And the son had to make a conscious decision to come back in fellowship with God. Keep your, Bible, keep, uh, sorry, keep your finger in Genesis 33. You don't, you don't need to stay in Luke. Go to 1 John, please. Go to the book of 1 John, chapter 1. 1 John, chapter 1. Brethren, I just want to encourage you, sort out your disputes. Sort out your conflicts. You know, maybe it's not with a physical person. Maybe you have a dispute with God. Maybe you have a conflict with God. Maybe you're angry with God because something in your life has not gone according to the way you wanted it to go, and so now you're blaming God. I don't know, okay? We can have disputes with men. We can have disputes with God. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, 1 John chapter 1, Verse 6, <clears throat> if we say that we have fellowship with Him, we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Brethren, are you walking in darkness? Are you in fellowship with God? You know, you might come to church and say, man, God, I, you know, I'm, I'm in, in good fellowship with you. But how have you lived throughout the week? Has your life reflected a life of fellowship with God? Or has your life been more one of, of self-pleasing? of self-gratification, of giving in to the temptations and committing sin. You know, if you're committing sin, the Bible says here that you walk in darkness, okay? You're not in fellowship with Him. Look at verse number 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Brethren, this is not about salvation, Okay? This is not about your position before God. You are a son to God. No matter what happens, if you believed on Christ, you are His son. This is about the way you walk your Christian life. Are you walking in light or are you walking in darkness? Brethren, what is it? What is it that you are doing? And, you know, we sin every day. You know, we sin every day. Meaning, every day there's a point where you're walking in darkness. And if you're walking in darkness, guess what? You're not in fellowship with the Father at that point in time. Okay? You're not in fellowship. You know, in order for us to maintain a close fellowship, a close walk with God the Father, is that we too walk in His light. Okay? Because that's where God resides. He resides in the light. And He can... Let's keep going there in verse number 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse number 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a promise. What a promise. Okay? That all we need to do, brethren, to maintain a close walk with God, all we need to do to remove ourselves from darkness back into the light with God is to confess our sins to God. To go, God, I messed up again. God, I committed this sin once again. You know, I'm too ashamed to say it to God. Well, God knows you committed it, okay? Just go and confess it to God. God, I've messed up again. God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. The Bible says crystal clear here. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You can't out-sin out God, okay? No matter how much you mess up your life, no matter how bad you end up in life, no matter how far you are, you are away from God, you cannot out, out, you know, get to a point where you've committed too much sin that God can't forgive you to get you back in fellowship, to get you back walking with God. 
And brethren, because we sin every day, we should confess our sins to the Lord every day. I would say, look, as soon as you sin, and as soon as you, you come to realize, I did wrong, that's the time. Just, just go to the Lord immediately. You know, don't save them up all day and then at night before bed, Lord, I'm sorry for my day. Because then you go all day without for walking in fellowship with God. You go all day without being in the light. You know, as soon as you sin, just, God, I messed up. I'm sorry. You know, and he's, he's going to forgive you. He's not going to turn around and say, well, you know, this is, the, this, is the, this is now 250 times you've done the same sin. That's it. I'm done. I'm not going to forgive. No, of course not. Okay. Now, again, this is nothing about salvation. You're saved. You're eternally saved. Once saved, always saved. This is about our walk, our fellowship with God. You know, and those that teach that you can lose your salvation, they love turning to these passages, which is clearly about our walk, but they turn that about salvation. It's not about salvation, okay? Um, if you look at First John, John's writing to the brethren, to the brethren, constantly the brethren, the brethren, okay? It's about saved people. Anyway, I just want to bring that to your remembrance, you know? When we have disputes, when we have conflict with men, go and sort it out. That's what God expects from you, okay? Go and sort it out. But when we've also broken fellowship with the Father, go and sort it out. Go and sort it out straight away, okay? Man sometimes won't forgive you, okay? It might take them longer to forgive you. It's possible because we're made of sinful flesh. But God the Father will forgive you immediately as soon as you go and confess those sins. Go and sort it out immediately. Keep a short account with God. Keep a short account with men. Back to Genesis 33, please. Genesis 33, verse 5. Genesis 33, verse 5. <clears throat> the Bible says here, And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children, this is Esau, and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servants. Praise God. You know, Esau sees the family. He sees, hey, these are my nephews. These are my nieces. These are my in-laws, right? And he says, who are these people? And Jacob responds correctly, the children which God have graciously given thy servants. And I told you the guys, the title for the sermon this morning was God have dealt graciously. Okay? God has dealt graciously. And I want to cover right now, um, uh, it's just to talk about God's grace. You know, what is the grace of God? You know, the reason you're given things is because God is gracious towards you. You know, often people talk about what is it, what, what does it mean, to, what does grace mean? What, what is it? It's unmerited favor. You know, when God shows grace towards you, it's because you didn't deserve it. All right? And so how valuable is God's grace when you don't deserve it and he gives it to you anyway? You know, when God has given you things in life, he's given it to you because of his grace. And I want to talk about that a little bit today. If you guys can go, keep your finger there in Genesis 33 and go to 1 Corinthians 15, please. Go to 1 Corinthians 15 for me. And the first thing, while you're tuned there, that's not my first point. The first point that I have when we talk about God's grace, immediately the first thought that probably pops in your mind is salvation. And yes, salvation is by God's grace. The Bible says in Titus 3, 7, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Right? The Bible says that. It is by God's grace that we receive salvation. Brethren, unmerited favor. You did not merit salvation. Okay? When we go and talk to, the, to our, our, our neighbors, we talk to our, our community about salvation, well, I think I'm good enough for heaven. No! You know, it's un salvation is unmerited. If you think you can merit salvation, then that's not grace. Okay? God's grace is how He offers us His gifts. And His gifts are unmerited, brethren. Unmerited. We did not do anything to earn that. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. 1, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. It says here, Paul speaking about himself, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, and am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul looks back at his past, goes, well, I'm the least. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. Why? Because he persecuted 
God's people. He threw them in prison. You know, his desire was to destroy the Christians, to destroy the church of God, and reflects back to his old life when he was that way. But then look what he says about himself in verse number 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. He says, the reason I'm an apostle, the reason God can use me, the reason I'm writing the New Testament books is because of the grace of God. Unmerited, I didn't deserve this, he says. I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. It says, God's given me his grace. He's given me this important office of, of, of an apostle. Yes, I worked hard, but then he stops for a moment. I've worked hard. I've labored more than all. But then to not promote himself, he says, why was he able to work hard? Yet not I, it wasn't me really that worked hard, but by the grace of God, which was with me. He says, the reason I was able to labor and work for the Lord is because of his grace once again. The second point of, of God's grace that I want to bring to your attention there is a transformed life. A transformed life. He was persecuting the church of God. Now he's one of the main leaders in the church of God. And God is using him because of God's grace. Okay? You know what else God's grace has done for you? He's given you a transformed life. Now for many that were saved at an early age, or like me, grew up in a Christian home, <clears throat> I don't really have that much of a transformed life. Okay? That's okay. And the reason I've not destroyed my life is because of God's grace, okay? But some of you have made major mistakes in life. Some of you look back and you can say, look, I'm just the least of, of the people. I'm the least of the brethren. I, I, I'm the least in the church because of my past. Well, brethren, don't dwell in the past, okay? Dwell on God's grace, which has given you a transformed life. You know, you aren't what you were before, you know? What did Paul say? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Say, where are you today? Has, has things improved? Are you walking more in the light? Are you more godly? Do you have a greater wisdom? Do you know better about how to conduct yourself in life? Have you been able to overcome some of those temptations, some of those sins in the past? Well, you are what you are because of the grace of God. God's grace has not only given us salvation, but God's grace also can give us a transformed life. A transformed life. A change. You guys in 1 Corinthians, go to 2 Corinthians for me. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You know what else God's grace can give you? He can give you spiritual strength. Spiritual strength. You know, you might not be very strong physically. You may not be one of the strongest people out there. One thing you can definitely be because of the grace of God is spiritually strong. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says, And he said unto me, my, this is what God says to, to Paul, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Brethren, are you weak? You probably are. I'm a weak person. I have failings. I have weaknesses. But God wants to take you in your weakness. God wants to give you His grace and make you strong. And then it says here, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Man, you can be spiritually strong. You know, when you stand on God's Word, it is the rock of our faith. Okay? It is a rock of our salvation. Don't let anyone move you from God's word. You're going to be stronger than anybody you know when you can be spiritually strong in the faith, brethren. Spiritually strong in the faith. Okay? No matter what hardships come your way, and here Paul speaks about a personal infirmity that he has, the thorn in the flesh, right? He goes, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Can you tell me today if you have an infirmity? You know, some sickness, some chronic disease. Can you tell me honestly that you glory in your infirmities? You say, I, I don't, in fact, I, I don't glory. Well, you need to get in touch with God's grace. <laughs> you need to ask God to bestow His grace upon you, to give you the strength. 
Because then he said there that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul goes, I know when I'm weak, I know when I'm sick, that God's grace is what I need to rely on. God's strength is what I need to rely on. And God's going to give that to me when I'm weak. He's able to glory in that area because he knows he's going to get more of God's glory than he would if he was in full health, in full uh, strength. Look at verse number 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Say, Paul, man, you're crazy. Hey, this is true. He takes pleasure in his infirmities, not just infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong, he says. Brethren, you might be the weakest Christian. You might be the least of the Christians that you think, that you personally think out there. But that just means good news for you. Okay? That means God's grace can fall upon you, can be bestowed upon you, and you can be strong in God's strength. In the power of Jesus Christ, you can be strong instead of in your own physical strength. So God's grace gives us salvation. It gives us... um, What was the second thing? I forgot what I said. A transformed life and spiritual strength. Okay? In the weaknesses of your flesh, flesh, you can still have great strength about you. I'll get you to turn to um, turn to Romans chapter twelve for me. Romans chapter twelve, and I'll read some other passages out to you. You guys go to Romans twelve. I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter one verse seven. What else does God's grace give us? It says here, "In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins." This is salvation according to the riches of his grace so we're talking about the riches of god's grace but then ephesians 1 8 says this wherein so we're in like basically talking about the grace of god there wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence all wisdom and prudence what else does god's grace gives us give us it gives us wisdom it gives us knowledge it gives us prudence. Prudence is when you're careful, when you notice what is dangerous and you stay away from that. Okay? And, and, and God's grace is able to do that, not just salvation, but it says He have abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. You want wisdom, brethren? You want to know what God thinks about things? You want to know the truth of this world? You want to know the truth of the, the spiritual powers? God can give you wisdom accessible through his Bible, through his book. You know, and, and I know, you know, I, I struggle sometimes as I read from my Bible. I sometimes struggle, what is this referring to? What is this about? And when that happens, you just go and ask God for his grace. Go ask him for his wisdom. Go ask him for knowledge. And quite often, God will tell you what it is. Many times I prepare a sermon when I'm going chapter by chapter in the Bible. And I'm like, God, I have no idea what this is. I go away, have a shower. I go away, do something else, have a sleep on it, come back. I'm like, oh yeah, that's what it's about. <laughs> right, why? Because God's grace, right? God's given me His grace, He's given me wisdom, He's shown me what He, took, what he means, and then I can preach it, okay? I, I go through the same struggles as you do, brethren. Sometimes I read the Bible and I'm like, I have no idea what that is. Well, ask God for wisdom. That's what His grace can give you, wisdom and prudence. And also, um, I'm going to read to you from Hebrews 4. You guys stay in Romans 12. I'm going to read to you from Hebrews 4, verse 15. What else does God's grace give us? It says here, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was, on, sorry, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And I love verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Brethren, what else does God's grace gives, give us? It gives us help in the time of need. Help in the time of need. Help in the time of trouble. Brethren, the reason when you go through hardships, when you go through persecution or some trial, some difficulty, you know what God allows you to do? He allows you to go to His throne boldly. You know, not creeping on your, on your, you know, on your hands and your feet, with your, with your head lowered, oh man, God, will you hear me? He goes, come boldly to my throne. Come and tell me what you need. Come and ask me for help. You know why you can do that, brethren? Because of God's grace. You don't deserve it, 
It's unmerited. God allows us to go before Him, before His throne, in heaven. Of course, we can't do that physically, but that's prayer. In prayer before God, asking for aid, asking for assistance in our time of trouble. And the last thing, guys, you're in Romans 12, verse 5 that I have here. Romans 12, 12 verse 5. Bringing it back here to our local church, our local New Testament body of Christ. It says here in verse number 5, So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Verse number 6. Having then gifts, different, according, look at this, according to the grace that is given to us. What's the Bible teaching here? That in the body of Christ, we're all different, and God has given us gifts. We all have spiritual gifts, brethren, to serve the body of Christ. Okay? And the gifts have been given to us according to the grace of God, right? That has been given to us. It says here, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion, uh, proportion of faith. So God has given some people the ability to preach, to open up His Word and preach to the people. Verse number 7, all ministry. Let us wait on our ministry. Ministry. Now, this is a general term, ministry. Ministry just means to serve. Any area that you can find to serve in the church, go for it, brethren. Come and let me know. Hey, I would like to take care of X, Y, and Z. You notice there's something to do? You notice there's maybe you're not doing anything for the body of Christ? Just find something to do, all right? Find something to do. You know, whether it's... Honestly, you know, I have people that take care of the toilets, I have people that just tidy up when the kids make a mess. That's ministry. That's serving one another. Okay? And we should teach our children to minister, to serve one another. Okay? It's all, what can I do? You know, Sister Eve brings morning tea for us. Hey, that's a ministry that she found. Hey, that's a gift, a spiritual gift that God has given her through her grace. You know, through, through God's grace, sorry, to serve the body of Christ. We all have something. You just need to figure out what that is. You know, Sister Trish, with her cards. Christmas cards, you know, that we've got up there. Hey, you know, that's a gift that God has given her to serve the local body. I mean, there's so many things. I, I, I don't even know what they all are. Just find something to do and just do it. All right? Just find something to do and serve the brethren. Let's keep going. Uh, verse number seven, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. You know, some of you have been given gifts of exhortation. Say, what's that? Just to lift each other up. Hey, brother, great seeing you this morning. Hey, sister, praying for you. You know, hey, just been thinking about you for this week. I've been praying about you. You know, is everything okay? You know, maybe, you know, maybe you remember things that people have been going through, some difficulties. You go to them and just ask them about it. Hey, how's that? Have you been able to resolve that? You know what you're doing? You're just edifying. You're, you're exalting the brethren. You're lifting them up. That's a spiritual gift that God may have given you. You know, it may not be something that's sort of physical and outward, but it's just you edifying, lifting, exhorting the brethren. That is a gift. Verse number eight, or he that exhorteth an exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Hey, maybe some of you have been blessed financially. Maybe God's grace has fallen upon you and you have more than you need. And you can give more to the local church. Hey, that's a gift that God has given you, right? He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, even mercy, showing mercy on brethren. You know, churches made up of believers, often people are very hard on each other. Christians are very hard on each other. And there are some that are just more merciful, right? Are more forgiving, you know, are more likely to oversee someone's fault and say, well, you know, we all have faults. Hey, if you have that, that mercy about you, that's a gift, all right? That's a gift uh, that you have that God has given you. I mean, you know, there are many, many things. This is a list of things that, you know, some things only men can do, like preach. Obviously, we know that. But there are other things here that anybody can do. You know, women and children uh, can participate in the spiritual gifts that God has given us. So just a reminder, when, you know, when, when Jacob spoke about how God has graciously given him things, I want you to think about what has God graciously given you. Number one was salvation. Number two was a transformed life. Number three was spiritual strength. Number four was wisdom. Number five was help in time of need. But I want you to think about this local body that you're in right now, the gifts of ministry. You know, what gift has God given you for this ministry, for this church, and put it into practice? Put it into practice, okay? Back to Genesis 33, verse 6. Genesis 33, verse 6. 
Genesis 33, verse 6. Then the handmaidens came near. So um, Jacob is introducing his family now, right? That's why he split them up this way. Then the handmaidens came near, they and their children, and they bowed themselves. And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And after came Joseph near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves. And he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, These are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. So just a reminder of verse number eight there. Esau's asking, What's all these all these animals, all these droves? They if you remember they were gifts, they were presents that Jacob wanted to give to Esau to help, you know, you know, um, calm him down in case he was coming to do something horrible to him. And um, he says, so what is this? And, he, and uh, Jacob responds, these are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. And then he says, and Esau said, I have enough, my brother, keep that thou hast unto thyself. And Jacob said, and by the way, brethren, if someone comes and gives you a gift, and I know I've done this, and I know you do this, if I come and give you a gift, oh, don't worry, brother, you don't need to give that to me. Listen, when someone comes to give you a gift, just accept it. Learn to accept the gifts, all right? This is why so, so many people are hardened to the gospel. You're offering them free gifts. Ah, oh, no, I can do it on my own. You know, that's the same attitude you have when someone comes to give you a gift. And you're like, oh, don't worry about it, brother. And look, I, I do it, all right? It, it's just a bit of pride, all right? And Esau here has a little bit of pride. Just accept, look, Jacob's willing to give this to you. Someone's willing to do something great for you, something nice for you. You may not need it. Receive it. Receive it because it's a blessing that that person wants to give you. Just learn to receive it. Learn to say thank you, okay? And then uh, verse number 10, And Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face. Now look at this. As though I had seen the face of God, and thou was pleased with me. I got you to read in the previous chapter how when, God, when, when Jacob wrestled Jesus, he said he saw God face to face, all right? So he did see Jesus Christ face to face. And now he refers to the way I look at Esau. You know, finding the grace that I found in Esau for myself, it's like he saw the, the face of God. You know what he's referring to? He's basically saying, God has answered my prayers. You know, the, the same grace that God has given me, when I saw the face of God and, and His grace, I see that now in your face, Esau, is what he's saying. That's what he's saying, right? You know, I've gone to God with my request, and God has answered. God has answered. You haven't come here to kill me. You haven't come here to slay me. Now, I don't know if that was Esau's intention, and God just changed his heart halfway through. I don't really know. The Bible doesn't give us that information, right? But Jacob's able to just refer back to the, to the wrestling with God, back to the prayer when he was weeping, when he was needing things. He looks at the answered prayer and says, man, I see. It's, like, it's like looking at God's face here, Esau. The same grace that was in God, I see that grace in your face. I think it's a great thing there. And verse number 11, Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. Okay? So what I want to take from there in verse number 11, guys, is when God deals with you graciously, give it back to others. When God has given you the grace of gifts of the Spirit, Give it to others. That's serving the church, serving the local body of Christ. Find something to do and do it. Even if it's just to edify the brethren, it's a great gift for you to have. Not many Christians have that grace. All right. Uh, verse number 12. And he said, let us take our journey and let us go, and I will go before thee. Now, this is quite an interesting thing because Esau's obviously met Jacob, and it, now he's telling Jacob, let's go together on our journey back, back, back to where Esau lives, basically. And this is how Jacob responds. And he said unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender. So obviously Jacob has his children, has his wives, has his children, maybe the servants' children as well. You know, there's probably a whole bunch of kids around him. And Esau's come with 400 men. All right. So Esau wants to go on this journey together with him. But Jacob looks at the children. He says they're tender, they're young, right? And then he goes, And the flocks and herds are young, with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servants, and I will lead on softly, according as the cattle that go before me, and the children are a be able to endure, until I come unto my Lord unto Seah. Now you probably, when you read your Bible, you probably just read over that, okay? 
But what's happening is Jacob realizes, look, if, you, if you're traveling, you're going to be a lot faster than us. Okay, and, and basically, we're not going to be able to keep up. We're not going to, have, you know, we've got children, we have these livestock, you know, and, and if we need to stay and look after these things. So, you know, we're going to take, uh, uh, the journey is going to be longer for us to take, but I'll, I'll meet you there eventually, okay? But you go about your way. And I think this is a really great lesson that parents need to learn. Parents need to learn, okay? And even churches, and I'll, let me talk about parents first. But what we see here with Jacob is that he puts the needs of his family first. Yes, he's sorted things out with Esau. Yes, that's his twin brother. But God has not made him accountable for his twin brother. God has given him wives. God has given him children. And the people that he is accountable for, brethren, are his wives and his children, of course, his servants, and those that are under his authority. Okay? Now, I'll bring this up because uh, this was a, and I've already touched on this, but in, in past sermons, but I remember after getting married, after having kids, I still wanted to spend time with my friends. I still wanted to play indoor soccer every week. I still wanted to do the things that I was doing in the past when I was single, okay? And I I had to come to a realization, a maturity, right? And go, that's not my priority in life anymore. My wife is my priority. My children are my priority, okay? And one thing you need to learn, even if it upsets other people, even if it upsets extended family, you've got to make decisions based on your wife, on your children, on those that God has put authority, put you, uh, sorry, put under your authority. That's your priority. That's how you make decisions. You know, and Esau's not doing anything bad. He means well. You know, he wants Jacob to come with him. Jacob says, look, I can't keep up Esau. I've got children. I've got a wife. I've got these cattle. I've got these servants. I'm looking after this first. This is my priority, brethren. And you need to think about, you know, your children, your wives, you know, your family. And you have, I'm sure, extended family. I'm sure you have unsaved extended family that mean well, that probably want you over for some party. All right? Christmas parties are coming up, right? They probably want you over for that. And, you know, I'm going to leave that up to the head of the homes, whether you decide to be part of that or not. You know the effect that will have on your families. But if you have a lot of unsafe families, there's probably the alcohol flowing, all right? There's probably talk of things that you don't want your kids to listen to. There's probably other influences out there that you don't want to affect your family. And you're just going to have to make a decision, no, I can't be part of that party. I can't be part of that celebration. I love you, all right? I love you, you're my my family, but I've got to put the needs of my family first. I've got to look after my children first. I don't want them to be affected by those things in the world, okay? That's the lesson. I I think we see with Jacob a great leader, a great father, making sure he takes care of his personal needs first. You know, uh, again, you know, I would often have to travel for work. You know, when I was working in my old workplace, often travel for, they always wanted me to go somewhere. And I was cool with that. I liked the experience of seeing other places, you know, visiting other cities, all that kind of stuff. But before I made a decision to say yes, I would always go to my wife. I'd always go to Christina. You know, if I were to go this week, what would you need? What, what do you need? Make sure things are taken care of before I go. And I would never, never go for more than one week. Never. Okay? I would never because I'm needed at home. I'm the head of my family. I'm the provider. I'm providing safety. I'm the spiritual head. If I'm gone for too long, I neglect my family. I neglect my children. And quite often, I just have to say to my bosses and say, look, all right, I'll go. You want me there for a month? I can't be there for a month. I can be there for a week. So what week do you want me to go? Okay, why? Because I'm a family man. Why? Because I have a wife and kids. I can't keep up with you. I can't go on your journey with you. I can go for a week, though. That's what I'm willing to do after I confirm that with my wife. You know, brethren, before we started the church down in Sydney, I knew I'm going to be away one solid day every week away from my family away from this church. You know, you're my priority when it comes to the church, you know? And what did I do? Did I just make a decision on my own? No, I brought this to the men in the church, right? We prayed about it for weeks and weeks and weeks about whether we should start a church down in Sydney. And the majority, I think everyone, in fact, said, yeah, let's do it. You know who who else I asked? My wife. You know who else I asked? My kids. And if my wife had said to me, "I I just can't afford to lose you here for, you know, one day a week, I would not have started the church down in Sydney. 
Why? Because my priority are my wife and my children. Okay? My wife goes, yeah, do it. All right? Do it. You know, I'm willing to sacrifice that time with you. Go and do it. Praise God. You know, you put your family first. You put your priorities first in place. And God will bless you. God will see you through. And the other thing that, I, that brings to my remembrance here is Jacob's thinking of the children. He thinks that they're tender, you know. And when we think about the church, I'm always thinking about the children. Always. Anything we decide to do, I'm thinking, but what about the kids? All right, if we go out soul winning for two hours, what about the kids? You know, there are little ones. What are their nap times? Parents need to get them probably home. They need to be fed, you know. And, you know, if church was run, there's a, there's a reason why the qualifications for a bishop and a deacon is to be a husband of one wife and to have faithful children, okay? It's because you know the effects. If you make decisions, you know what kind of effects that can have on family, on children. You know, you've been in churches in the past when there's been ministries and you can't participate of that ministry because of your family, because of your children, because of something. And so in order to, to make sure church runs most effectively, I, I'm always thinking about the children. You know, when I, when I get here behind the pulpit to preach, I don't use big fancy words. Well, number one, because I guess I'm not that great. <laughs> I'm not that eloquent in my speech. But number two, because I'm thinking about the kids. I want the kids to understand. I want the kids to learn. We've made our mistakes, all right? The kids are still young. They still can make mistakes. And I want them to know what the Word of God says, you know, first and, and foremost. I'm preaching to the children first and foremost. You know, it gives me great delight when I see the children sitting at the front, you know, sitting still, paying attention. Because I'm preaching to you children, okay? I, I don't want you. You know, and, and as, as a church, we need to remember that this is the next generation. We need to remember we're going to pass on. And, and these kids are going to be the next leaders. They're going to be the next families in the church. They're going to be the ones doing the work of God. We need to make sure we pass down a good legacy, you know, a good inheritance as a church. And just recently down in Sydney, uh, because I'm trying to be less involved, we organized a team of... Uh, of, of, I call it the men's leadership team, where they can get together, have meetings, and make decisions for the church. So I'm less involved. Now, I can still, I'm, I still oversee that. They're under my authority. But when I organize that group, you know what I said? It has to be men that are married with children attending this church. I'll tell you why. Because a single guy would be like, well, why don't we go soul winning for five hours after church this, tonight? Right? <laughs> That's what's going to happen. The single guy has nothing else to do, right? He wants to have a good lunch. He wants to go in fellowship and just go and do some good soul. And good, praise God. Praise God for your zeal. Praise God for the position you're in. If God can use you for five hours in one day soul in, go for it. But that's not going to suit families with little kids, okay? And so the men's leadership team is made up of people with children. So when decisions are passed, they can understand what effect that can have on their families. We see that's what Jacob does. That's what Jacob does, okay? Back to Genesis 33, verse 15. Genesis 33, verse 15, it says here, And Esau said, Let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said, What need of it? Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way unto Seir. Again, we see a great quality in Jacob here. You know, Esau says, Well, let me leave some men with you to help you on your journey. Jacob is pretty much a self-made man, all right? By the grace of God. By what God has given him, he's a great leader. Not just a great leader, not just a great father, not just looking for those that are under his authority, but he's also self-made. He's a provider, okay? And he's got things taken care of. He goes, look, no, it's all good. It's all taken care of. You know, I don't need these extra people here to help us on our journey. And so I see some great qualities here in Jacob, even though we have learned about a lot of his mistakes as well that he's made. But verse number 17, And Jacob journeyed to Succoth, and built him an house, and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. And Jacob came to Shalem, um, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padanaram, and pitched his tents before the city. So, just, just as an interesting fact, when the Bible says here in verse number 18, and Jacob came to Shalem, that's also Salem in the New Testament. And just very quickly, John 3.23 says, And John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. So this makes sense why Jacob would want to come to Shalem or Salem, because there's much water there, okay? He's got a lot of cattle, he's got a lot of stuff, 
and they need obviously access to water, but it's the same place that John the Baptist was doing some baptisms in John chapter 3. And then it says here, and Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem. Now the city is called Shechem, but it's called Shechem because there's a man called Shechem. Okay, let's keep going in verse number 19. And he bought a parcel of the field where he, where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father. So he buys a piece of land from Shechem's father, Hamor. So Hamor has called the city Shechem after his son, right? For a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. So just two points that I want to end on there, just, just uh, as we go into the next chapter for, on, on Wednesday. But Shechem is introduced to us for the first time here, Shechem. And obviously this is a, a family of unsaved people. They're Canaanites, okay? And Shechem will play a major role in chapter 34. So when we get to chapter 34, we go for Shechem. You remember why? Because Jacob's come to stay on this land, okay? The last point that I have there in verse number 20 is that when Jacob goes, he erects an altar for the Lord, right? To offer his sacrifices, to offer his offerings to the Lord of thanksgiving. So he keeps the Lord in mind, everything, everywhere he goes. And then he calls that place El Elohi Israel. Now, I'm not going to go back to the Hebrew here. I think for some of you guys that know, what, like you probably look at that and you already know what it says. The word, you know, when you read El, more often than not, that's a reference to God. Okay. And then it says, El Elohi Israel. We know who Israel is. That's the name that Jacob, uh, God gave Jacob, the new name, Israel. And all this is saying here is basically, it wrecks this altar and he says, you're the God of Israel. <laughs> that, that's, that, that's what he calls the altar, right? He called it, you're the God of Israel. And obviously giving thanks, giving appreciation for the great grace that God has given in Jacob's life. Let's pray.